I always love when that comes on. Uh, and just those of you who uh, all have just joined on or may not necessarily be familiar with the Minority Serving Institutions Initiative within the Rackham Graduate School, uh, this started about three and a half years ago uh, and, and largely came out of the institution-wide DEI plan. Many of the schools and colleges, there are 18 schools and colleges, 19 if you include the Rackham Graduate School, and about half of those uh, identify engaging with more minority serving institutions more deeply to kind of address their, um, their um, diversity, equity, inclusion um, related challenges in their respective spaces, right? And so I came in about three and a half years ago, and the way that we've constructed this work is to provide support to the various um, university mission graduate and professional programs and their outreach to and uh, their engagement with minority serving institutions um, towards building these mutually beneficial relationships, those that are bi-directional and that foster inter-institutional rapport and trust, strengthen pathways for marginalized student populations and collaboration across institutions. And this is all in the spirit of our goals for not just the, the initiative, the coffee chat series and why we've uh, invited Dr. LeVon Essers to join us here today. And just to provide you all a roadmap of today's session, um, Dr. Essers will, will um, have, uh, provide a presentation for about 30 to 35 minutes and then the remaining time will be left for us to ask questions. Again, as Michelle pointed out, please feel free to use the chat function if you have any questions, the raise hand feature or um, other mechanisms that are, are made available. And then just for a little bit of background information on uh, Dr. Esters, he's a professor in the Department of Agricultural Sciences and Communicate Sciences Education and Communication at Purdue University, where he also serves as the director of mentoring at Purdue, which is a, a program designed to increase the representation of students from marginalized and minoritized backgrounds receiving uh, post-secondary STEM-based agriculture and life sciences degrees and Purdue's College of Agriculture. I uh, also want to note that Dr. Essers is also an HBCU alum, uh, FAMU, uh, is that, I got it right, correct? So I just want to shout out to, to all my HBCU folks uh, here in the room, there's some others that are joining us here uh, today. Uh, Dr. Esther's research focuses on uh, issues of educational equity and access of marginalized and minoritized students with a concentration on the mentoring needs of Black graduate students, STEM career development of students attending HBCU land-grant colleges and universities, and educational and professional mobility and development of Black graduate students and faculty. Uh, Dr. Esther's is among uh, the few, which is why we invited him out here today, uh, Black scholars in the United States con conducting research in these areas and has been able to serve as a role model for Black graduate students who are committed to broadening participation of mar marginalized and minoritized students in ag uh, and STEM disciplines. Uh, so with that, I would like for you all to just give them a big hand clap, if you will. Uh, invite Dr. Levon Esters to uh, impart upon us his wisdom uh, 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 for the next half hour or so. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Esters. Well, thank you for that uh, welcome and introduction, Edmund. Um, so I'm really excited, everyone, to be here with you today. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, presenting, and I'm also looking forward to the questions uh, that will arise after I, after I present. So having said that, what I would encourage you to do is, and I say this every time I give a talk or presentation like this, is uh, please, please, please jot down your questions, place them in the chat. I'm sure uh, Edmund and Michelle and, and Maureen will help facilitate that uh, those questions and, and bring them to my memory when, it's, when this is over. I also have my, my, my phone here. I'm gonna hit start in a minute. I set myself at about 35 minutes. So I'll try to stick to that time as well. But I'm really looking forward to uh, this discussion. So without further ado, let me pull up my presentation for today and take you through um, some things. So, so again, I'm really looking forward to this. And, and, and so I would encourage you to really think deeply about um, this topic today and uh, actually learn something new. I didn't know that the, this uh, program that Edmund spoke of had only been around for three and a half years. So I just learned something new. And I think a lot of what he shared today uh, coincides well with what I'm going to present to you about, which is uh, creating pathways of success for Black graduate students through collaborative partnerships with historically Black colleges and universities or HBCUs uh, is, is what they normally go by. 
And as Edmund mentioned, I always tell people that if you were to cut my arm, I bleed orange and green. That's how much love I have for uh, Florida A&M Florida University or FAMU. And I also received my master's degree from another HBCU, North Carolina A&T State University. So I had the privilege and uh, to attend two uh, well-known HBCUs. And I tell individuals a lot of my identity was developed at these institutions. Um, so not only having attended, I think um, contributes a lot to my work and what I'm gonna to speak to you today about, but I think it also gives me a perspective that um, is unique in, in that case. So let me take you through um, uh, some things today. And so I wanna kind of take you through um, what we're gonna focus on. So this is kind of an overview of what today is gonna to be about. So I'm gonna provide you with understanding of how to develop reciprocal and equitable collaborative partnerships with HBCUs. I think that's important, those two components of reciprocity and, equi and being equitable. And also I'm going to focus on um, some collaborative partnership practices taken from the Mentoring at Purdue program or what we like to refer to it as Purdue as the MAP program. So you don't have to say the full name, just say MAP and then I'll know what you're talking about. And it's a nationally recognized and award-winning Inclusive excellence, inclusive excellence focused mentoring program that we developed. And I'll give you some of the history in a moment about the MAP program. I'm, and for that matter, I'm not sure Edmund maybe knows much about it. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing Edmund as well, what questions you may have about MAP. So it's the play on words, right? Today's roadmap, like a little joke, a little humor, academic humor. And so what I'm gonna do is provide an overview of the mentoring of the MAP program I'm then going to take you through and highlight the importance of collaborative partnerships with HBCUs. I'm also going to outline some strategies, if you will, to lead to an understanding of how to engage with HBCUs. I'm also going to describe strategies that lead to the development of reciprocal and equitable collaborative partnerships with these institutions. I'm going to also share with you and outline some pitfalls that should be avoided when developing collaborative partnerships with HBCUs. Um, and lastly, we're going to have some Q&A or Q&D, if you will, some questions and discussion then. So again, please jot down your questions or place them into the chat. So let me talk to you a little bit about the MAP program. So the MAP program was established in 2013. So I serve as the director of the MAP program. I have a colleague who you see a little bit in the slide, uh, Dr. Neil Knobloch, he's the co-director. And we established the MAP program in 2013. And the focus of the, pre of the program was to increase representation of students from marginalized and minoritized backgrounds, uh, such that they would pursue advanced degrees or graduate degrees in the College of Ag, but also not only that, but even across the entire institution. So this program, even though I'm based, my appointment, my faculty appointment is, is within the College of Ag, all of what you're seeing a little bit, all of our programming initiatives span across the entire institution. And the second thing, a second goal that we had with the MAP program was to enhance the quality of the graduate school experience. Because as most of you know, the two reasons why students leave graduate school, one is funding and the second is poor mentoring. And so through this second goal, we wanted to address issues tied to faculty mentorship and also offer some best practices about uh, how faculty members and staff can, can uh, be better mentors to students. So this is the goal of what we laid out when we started the program in 2013. So uh, we actually received the grant in 2012, uh, but we actually kicked off the creation of the MAP actually as it, as it is today, uh, one year later. So almost approaching 10 years, and I've been at Purdue now 12 years. So being a scholar that I am, and many of you, if not most of you on here, I uh, believe in frameworks, right? And so this is the framework for the MAP program. Um, we took some time to develop this, and so this is kind of gives you a visual representation of what goes into the program and, and what it's focused on. And so what you see here is that the whole goal of the MAP program was two areas, two lanes, if you will, we wanted to focus on. We wanted to focus on recruitment of students, which is in that bottom right-hand side, and then retention of students, in particular, Black graduate students is what we focused on. And so in this house, so all these elements are what make map what it is today. So we have the roof of the, of the structure and we focus on mentoring throughout all of what we do. 
And for those of you who know anything about mentoring, there are two pillars to mentoring. You have an instrumental, which is some of the career advising, those sorts of things, support. And then you have the psychosocial support, which are things like being a friend, offering support, you know, sense of belonging, those sorts of things that provide that psychosocial support. And then we achieve uh, a lot of what we do through the retention side, which is, again, it's left-hand side. And we do this through offering monthly workshops. We have our invited lecture series that I'll speak a little bit about uh, in a moment. And we have a peer mentor program. And then on that right-hand side, which is tied to recruitment, which we call the gateway to Purdue, we have the Summer Scholars Program, we have a resource guide that we developed, again, that you'll hear about in a little bit, and we have a MAP newsletter. But not only that, we also have very good support from across the institution, not only with my department, from my department head, from my dean. Uh, we have deans across Purdue's campus and many of the colleges. Uh, also, we have support within a senior administration. So our provost, who's my former dean, he's been supportive, our vice provost for diversity and some of those individuals. We also have various departmental staff and faculty that support us. We have relationships with the cultural centers at Purdue University. And we also have various campus stakeholders within Purdue, but also outside of Purdue and other partners. And so again, this framework, this house is how we uh, kind of visualize it, is, is the framework for the MAP program. So I wanna make sure that I share that with you so you can kind of get a feel for that. This is, I think it's important when you're developing prank programs like this, that you have some sort of framework that undergirds uh, the activities of your program. And so in our case, uh, we have this, this sub house. So the next thing I wanna focus on is uh, our leadership team and approach and our structure. I think this is gonna be important for you, for those of you who maybe have an interest in developing programs. So uh, one thing I wanna mention is that Everything we do, we use the lens of mentoring in all of our activities. So mentoring is that common thread through everything that we do. Um, but we utilize mentorship to provide, to develop professional and personal, uh, prof professional and personal skills of graduate students so that when they graduate, well, not only when they graduate, but even while they're graduate students within our college and other colleges and units, uh, but even within that, but also when they leave, that they become social agents of change. So that's one of the key elements that we, that we try to instill across our, our leadership team. And also a, a unique aspect of our program that many of you may not know is that in part, even though my, I'm the director and you have Dr. Knobloch who's the co-director, yes, we provide the vision for the program, but at the end of the day, the work, much of the work is done by the graduate students. So it's managed by graduate students. And you'll see in a moment uh, who some of these students are. And I also want to mention that uh, we achieve the goals that I shared earlier through the MAP program through six strategies. We have the Summer Scholars Program that I mentioned. We have a newsletter. We have a resource guide. We have the monthly seminars and webinars. We have an invited lecture series. And we have a peer mentoring program. So these, this is our portfolio, if you will, of, of activities, of strategies that we, uh, we carry out through the MAP program. So here is, our, is my great team. And again, I could not do this by myself. So you see me, uh, myself at the top with Dr. Knobloch, who serves as the director and co-director. And then you have, uh, this is our current team. Now at one point in time, maybe three years ago, we had as many as 12, 13 students uh, on our team. Uh, so we've been very fortunate to have a lot of great students work on our team. And just give you some, so these are the titles, these are the names, of course, and the titles that they hold. But Zach Brown, on your far left here, he's a, he's a doctoral student of mine. He attended Southern University in Baton Rouge. Uh, you have uh, Steve McBride, he's a doctoral student of mine. He went to University of Tennessee. Ariane Patterson just graduated in December. She's from Fresno, California. She is a graduate of Preview a and University. That then you have um, Andre Zabala Parilla. He's from Columbia. He's a doctoral student, Dr. Knobloch's. You have Cornell France in the bottom left. He's a master's student of mine. He's a graduate of Florida um, A&M University. You have Ryan Cornegay, who's who will be graduating next month uh, or sometime this summer. He is a graduate of Florida A&M University. And then you have Victoria Parker, who's a current uh, doctoral student of mine. She'll be finishing up her master's here this summer. 
and she's a graduate of Prairie View A&M University. So as you can see, one thing I like about this picture is that our team is diverse. And, and, and I would argue that most programs similar to this across the country uh, would not be able to uh, showcase the diversity within their teams like we do. And also we've been very fortunate to have students who have attended HBCUs work on our team. So we have this collective energy and, and, and diversity of thought and, and what they bring from each of their respective institutions that goes a long way to adding value to what we do in our MAP program act, uh, activities. So let me go through some of the things in the pr program that we have act, that we have that goes on. One, we have our MAP Summer Scholars Program, which is I would argue is probably one of the gems of our uh, of the MAP program. And you see on the left hand side, this was, was the 2019 cohort. We now have a program last summer because of, of course, because of COVID. Uh, but essentially, we bring students from uh, our partner institutions uh, to Purdue for a week in the summer, and they learn about graduate school. So these are rise. This is open to rising sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and master's degree students. And so you see on the right hand side what students can learn about uh, if they are selected to be a part of this program. This year, I'm excited to share, and if, please let me know uh, through admin or chat or some other means. This year's program is going to be virtual. And so this is the flyer that just came out two weeks ago, maybe. And I've been blasting on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, so on and so forth. And so uh, we cut it down to two-day event. And again, if you want this flyer, you want to share with, uh, if you have contacts and connections at HBCUs, uh, uh, MSIs for that matter, uh, feel free to let me know. But this is our virtual program, the virtual edition of the summer scholars program this year. So we're going to do some of the similar things, but again, it's going to be virtual over a day and a half, roughly period, time time period uh, in 2021. Then you have, as I mentioned earlier, we have a map newsletter and resource guide. So on the left-hand side, it's called Roadmap to Success. Again, another play on words that we do. And the purpose of this resource, of this newsletter, is just to share uh, updates on where we are, what we're doing, our speaking events on the far left hand banner of that of the newsletter, we highlight team members in that upper quadrant on here, um, and just some other information. And then on the right-hand side, we have this mentoring at Purdue. It's called Mapping, again, another play on words, Mapping Out Your Future, which is a resource guide, and it helps students who are interested in grad school. So we it talks about, uh, it highlights information on uh, graduate school application process, GRE, templates for contacting faculty, uh, explaining fellowships and assistantships, so on and so forth. So we have, this again is part of our portfolio of materials. Then we have also as, as part of our portfolio, one of those six things that we talked about earlier, six strategies. We have every month we hold a map workshop or webinar or seminar, well, used to be called seminars, but now in a virtual format, they're called uh, webinars. But on the left-hand side, you see uh, the lineup for the spring, this semester that we had. So we talked about everything. We have usually a panel of speakers, usually three or four. We talked about everything from mentoring and preparing BIPOC grad students for careers in family white fields. And then next month, April, which starts tomorrow, uh, building, your, building your brand, mentoring for entrepreneurial activities. So we put on these uh, webinars uh, or seminars, if you will, every spring and every summer, I mean, excuse me, every spring and in the fall of every academic year. Then on the right-hand side, we have our invited lecture series. And this year marked our seventh, yeah, our seventh, or ninth annual, excuse me, ninth annual invited lecture series. And so what we do is we bring in someone that's prominent within the STEM space that can speak to issues of connected to STEM, but more specifically on mentoring. So this year we had Dr. Stephanie Page, who is the creative uh, hashtag Black in STEM. Maybe you follow that. She's a phenomenal uh, individual. Also uh, went to a North Carolina A&T State University as well. But uh, one thing I'm proud of is that for nine years going, we have invited women of color to be our speakers. And that's something that we didn't intend to do that way, but we just happened to find that, you know, we looked up four or five years in, we just had this, this, this uh, momentum in that space. And so that's one thing that I'm proud about that every speaker we've had, and not to say that we can't have other speakers, I'm just saying uh, this is kind of how it just kind of uh, uh, evolved into. So we also have a pair mentor program that, uh, 
uh, Tori Crops, who's third from the left, uh, as a former doc student of mine. She's now a postdoc at Rice. And then next to her, uh, two from your left is Ulyssa Hester, who was a grad student of mine as well. They came up with this idea to create a peer mentor program. And the whole purpose of the program was to connect grad students to professional, uh, to help them you know, grow as professionals and some personal development. They engage in critical discussions. Again, faculty members did not attend. This is a, a, an organic program that was led by students. I would attend only if they wanted me to attend or Dr. Knobloch to attend, but this was driven by Tori and Ulyssa in this case. And in this uh, example, this picture you see here, uh, they also do fun things like social events. In this case, they went to painting with a twist um, here. So this is just an example of, of what the peer mentor program was focused on. So that, in a nutshell, everyone, is the MAP program. And again, if you have questions about that, feel free to ask me at the end. Um, but I want to now shift to what Edmund invited me to talk to you about today was uh, this notion of collaborative partnerships with HBCUs. Now, I will, I will say this, that our pro, the MAP program would not be what it is today if it were not for the partnerships that we have with our HBCU partners, period. Uh, yeah, we do a lot of good work at our home base, which is Purdue University, but even still, we would not be where we are today if it were not for the partnerships that we develop over the years. And so I want to provide you with a definition of style with, with uh, what we mean by collaborative partnership. And what we mean by that is simply an alliance of individuals um, who come together to achieve a common purpose, for a common purpose. That, in a nutshell, is what we mean by a collaborative partnership. So. Right here, emblazoned on your screen, are 17 of the seals of 17 institutions. And we have relationships, collaborative partnerships with all 17 of these institutions. And this is something that I'm also very proud of. And as you see here, these are uh, uh, not only are they HBCUs, but they are historically black land grant universities. HBLG uses the acronym. And maybe I can come back, maybe at some other point, uh, I'm going to talk about land grants. But anyhow, these seals represent the partners with the MAP program. Um, and so I'm very proud to, to, to showcase this. And just so you know, there are actually 19 historically black land grant universities, and we have partnerships with 17. The two, South Carolina State and West Virginia State University, really have loosely um, organized colleges of ag. Um, and who knows, maybe they'll come on board later, but right now, these 17 are who we work with. So I want to talk about some of our collaborative partnership activities. So WAM stands for Women and Minority in the Sciences. It's a grant uh, that uh, funded the, the MAP program in 2012. Uh, we started MAP with a $150,000 grant, and that grant was called WAMS 1.0. And so what we did with WAMS 1.0, 1.0 was when we established MAP program. And we started out with just two HBCU partners, FAMU, Florida AM University, and North Carolina AT State University. Of course, you can probably guess why, because I have social capital there, having been a graduate of those two institutions. So we started out small. Then we went to WAMS 2.0, which was roughly $92,000. And what we did with that, those funds is we elevated MAP, we expanded the number of HBCU partners. We also created additional student-focused experiences with WAMS 2.0. Then we have another grant, uh, about five, no, seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. This name of this program is called the Mentor Program. And I'll share with you in a second, and it built on MAP 1.0 and 2.0. But more specifically, we facilitate interactions and partnership development among twelve 1862s, which are the white land grants like Michigan State. I shouldn't say the thing, right? and uh, 1890s. And then I just want to mention, um, I recently was consulting with USA, um, and one of the reasons they reached out to me was because of my experience and, and work with the MAP, but I was uh, asked to help them think through and help them um, figure out how they can work cl more closely with MSIs um, and their innovation, Feed the Future Innovation Labs. And then we're currently working on a grant proposal that's due next Wednesday, uh, NSF uh, grant project, and it's going to build on MAP 1.0, 2.0, and Mentor. And what we're trying to do 
very simply is to uh, develop a more comprehensive approach to preparing HBCU students for graduate school and beyond. So this is our portfolio of, of funded projects and, and activities that uh, I'm engaged in, that our team is engaged in. And so again, this just gives you an example of all the ways that we collaborate with, uh, with HBCUs. So I want to talk for a little bit about the mentor project that I just mentioned in the previous slide. And here you see the seals of the institutions that are engaged in the mentor project. And you see here that some of these seals are ones that you saw on that two or three slides ago. And this project brings together 13 institutions, six HBCUs and, and seven PWIs. And they have 11 leadership teams. The reason why they're 11 and they're 13 institutions because Purdue uh, already has the MAP program. Penn State is our external evaluator. Um, and the goal of this project was to help them develop two-year mentoring programs, not necessarily many MAP programs, but really help them think about mentoring and how it can be used as a vehicle to increase retention and to recruit students. Um, and we do things like provide monthly webinars, uh, annual updates and feedback sessions. And we have actually a conference, first conference we held was last year. And again, the name of this project is called the Mentor Project. And if you want to learn more about this, uh, let me know and I can, I can send you the information on, uh, to our website. So I want to spend the last uh, 13 minutes or so uh, talking about the importance of collaborative partnerships with HBCUs. Now, it might have been, I think in Edmund's opening comments, uh, he alluded to, or maybe it was either in his opening comments or maybe before, uh, this session started uh, that um, a lot of what I'm sharing today is not common knowledge to many folks. Um, and so what I'm going to try to help you do is think through why this is important and how you do it. Now, also, I, I want to say that, remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. So it has taken us nine years, roughly, to get to where we are now. Um, and, and I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. So one thing I want to mention regarding the importance is that these, this notion of cross-institutional partnerships can you know, expand human capital and technical expertise. That's, that's one reason why it's important. Also, uh, and this is not, this is something that I see that PWIs don't really grasp in, in, in my observations that they need to understand that HBCUs at the end of the day have a number of strengths that would enhance partnerships. One, well, not only diversity of the faculty, but the fact that you have these institutions have connections, so you can broaden your, your scope and your impact in many ways. Also, these partnerships between HBCUs and PWIs can help advance diversity uh, of a unit, of a college, of a department. And I can tell you that in our department now, I will digress for a second. So let me say this, that when I came to Purdue in 2009, our department was last or probably tied for last in the college in terms of diversity among graduate students. Now we're number one. Now, there are two reasons for that. I would say one is a byproduct of the MAP program. Right? It's a space and it's people have come to know it and understand here's something that can support them. But let's be clear, I think it's also a byproduct of having a black faculty member, which they didn't have before. So I think all those things come into play, but even still, I do think that if you approach these collaborative partnerships the right way, it can result in, in greater diversity uh, in your departments or units. Again, we talked about this. It can have lasting benefits for all institutions. And it can result in institutions becoming agents of change. And we think about the mentor project. Here we are working with 13 institutions and more want to come on board. And the degree to which they buy in, when they participate and they carry out the, uh, the goals and objectives of our program, they will then themselves become known working in this space. So they become agents of change. And there's also a greater, greater likelihood that when you come together, you can achieve more capacity building um, uh, uh, efforts. Your, effort, your capacity building efforts can be uh, of greater impact if you come together and work together. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then also, I think something that uh, we should all be mindful of is that it does these collaborative partnerships will allow you to have a great ability to address uh, global grand challenges. So. Here's some, some, again, great reasons why uh, these partnerships are important. So you may be asking yourself, well, how do you engage with HBCUs? Well, let me, let me talk you through that. So, and, and what I'm sharing is what we have done. 
and what I have come to know matters. So I want to be very clear about that. Number one, you need to make visits to HBCUs, period. And these visits could be exploratory conversations are held. You learn about the, it's important that you learn about the institution and the campus culture. And you can also make these visits by having engaging or maybe coming up with a way that you can be invited to give a talk at the institutions, but you have to make visits and multiple visits is important. Even today, even though we're in COVID, we still make visits to our partners. Now with having 17, that's gonna be a little bit more difficult, but my point is, especially those that are just, we just uh, added to our portfolio, we will be visiting those institutions. And I love visiting HBCUs. I mean, I just, I love them uh, with all my heart. Second thing, uh, how you engage is hosting events, right? Faculty research exchange opportunities, student exchange, uh, student research exchange opportunities. Here's another way of how you can engage with HBCUs. And then also, of course, team projects that cut across research, teaching, um, outreach, engagement, those sorts of things. And then also grant proposals, like we've done uh, with the MAP program. So here are three primary ways that you can engage with HBCUs. But I would say all these are important, but I would say that first one is so critically important. You have to make visits. You have to understand the culture. You have to understand the people. It goes without saying that that is new, number one. You have to do that. So oftentimes, so we should be asking our que ourselves the question, what's in it for the HBCU? So whether it be Michigan, Illinois, Penn State, all these institutions want to engage with HBCUs. But this is the question you need to ask yourself when you want to engage. Is be outward, you know, think outwardly. What's in it for the HBCU? Oftentimes we think about what's in it for me, Michigan, Purdue, Illinois, Penn State. No, it should be the reverse. What's in it for the HBCU? And I'll share with you why you should focus on this. Because we all have seen this story before. I always like to say, I've seen this episode before where HBCUs are always targeted, but they're often not valued within the relationship. They're looked at as little brother. And then what happens is what? Skepticism then ensues on the intention of the relationship. So that's one reason why you need to be very careful, be very careful, excuse me, when you want to engage with HBCU. Also, one thing you can do is have a memorandum of understanding or agreement, MOU or an MOA. That can help. It lays everything out, makes everything clear. And also, there's also not just HBCUs, but MSIs of all types have much to contribute to partnerships through research efforts, teaching, extension outreach. So again, when you want to engage with HBCUs in particular, you need to keep these things in mind and, and try to follow through on all these activities that I'm outlining. Um, so I want to focus, maybe I have a couple of slides left, and I want to focus next to so transition next to this notion of developing reciprocal and equitable collaborative partnerships. So what do we mean by that? So one, you must identify common needs and interests and shared interests. It starts there. You know, why do we want to work with? Why does Michigan want to work with um, South Carolina State, uh, Tennessee State, Delaware State? What's the reason? What are our common interests, shared interests? What are our needs? You need to have mutual respect. So what makes the relationship between the MAP program and those 17 institutions, all I want to share with you, this is how we operate. We identify common needs and interests. There's mutual respect. There's shared decision-making. As director of MAP, I just don't make decisions. I have colleagues who are deans at these institutions, associate deans, faculty members, I know students. There's a shared decision-making when, we, when we're engaging. I also bring to the table, I also like to share, how, do, how would Tennessee State benefit from this relationship? How would Delaware State, how would um, Alabama a and benefit? So this is focus on what's the benefit. You also need to focus on what's the potential for sustain, sustainability. We're going on 10 years now, right? That's a, that's a pretty, that's pretty good. I never thought I would be in this game, if you will, 10 years later, uh, but it's, it's come to that. And uh, I think what makes it easier for me to connect with other MSIs is people see that there's been sustainability over the years. And they say, wow, this is not just one, 
you know, shot in the dark type of uh, situation that we're dealing with here. Also the potential for long-term impact. Of course, if you have students coming from Tennessee State to Purdue, getting a graduate degree, going on to work to be successful, it's long-term impact because what's going to happen is other students are going to want to follow in the footsteps of, of their peers. And also I mentioned this in the last slide, you have to have a shared understanding. That's what helps make this reciprocal, these relationships reciprocal and equitable. Shared understanding, and also, again, this can be achieved through an MOA or an MOU. So I want to end by sharing some pitfalls to avoid. And these, I think it's five items I want to share with you. Uh, these things happen all the time. And so I would encourage you to be mindful of these things when you're trying to develop collaborative partnerships with HBCs, but for that matter, any MSI, Anapeasy, HSI, 1994, so on and so forth. Lack of respect. That is usually one of the things that comes into play at the outset is a lack of respect. And I can tell you that those at HBCs pick up on that pretty quickly. The second thing is selfish motives. Most individuals think about what's in it for the PWI, what's in it for Michigan, what's in it for Illinois. Remember, we talked about this. Think about what's in it for the HBCU. So try not to have selfish motives. Lack of authentic engagement, right? We can all pick up on a lack of authentic engagement when we are in meetings with individuals. Um, so the same rule applies when you're engaging with institutions. If there's a lack of authentic engagement, more than likely HBCUs aren't going to want to uh, collaborate and partner with you. A lack of understanding of the HBCU context. Remember, I recall I shared that earlier. You have to understand the institution. You have to understand. And then last thing, cold calling. Just getting on the phone and say, hey, Alabama a &M, you want to work with me? Okay, like, who are you? You know, those sorts of things. So, uh, or they would ask, who are you? Excuse me. So cold calling usually doesn't work comes down to developing relationships and starting with the relationships. And then that will kind of uh, um, uh, snowball into hopefully uh, a long-term relationship, if you will. So what I wanna do is um, I like to end with this picture. I love this picture. Like if I could hang this on my wall in a room, I would. And so this is a picture of our, I believe it's our 2019 uh, class of MAP Summer Scholars. Um, and it's also, you have individuals in here, our team members. And so um, this is the last time we met in person, which was 2019. And I can tell you that many of these individuals, um, if they are still at their HBCU, uh, if they're not working course, but many have gone on to graduate school. And so for me to see this picture, the diversity that's represented here, I mean, this was not something you saw at Purdue University uh, by and large. Uh, and I'm not to say that I'm the only one doing this type of work, but in my college, I can tell you that this is not a scene that you saw 12 years ago. It just wasn't, uh, but it took time to get to this point. I think this year we had maybe 35 scholars from eight institutions, I believe. Um, but again, I like this picture because it really represents the essence and reflects the work that we put have put into this program and, and to see this and I'm Facebook friends with many of these students, Instagram, you LinkedIn, you name it. Uh, but to see this, um, it's just amazing to see where we've come starting with two institutions and now nearly 10 years later having 17 partners, 15 additional. So, um, so having said that, uh, let me show this last slide, and I'll cut and paste this and put it in the chat. Uh, please listen, if you have questions after the day, just reach out, it's just that simple. I will respond to email, I'll tweet back at you. I will, uh, you, can, you know, hit me on Instagram. Here's our map website, but I will cut and paste this and put it into the chat. So having said that, uh, Edmund, I'm down to 40 seconds left and stop out there and, and let you and uh, 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 facilitate the Q&A. So thank you. Very cool. Uh, first, uh, kudos to you for finishing uh, in the time and in, in the in that confined period of time because I surely would have gone over. So uh, appreciate you for that. Uh, can we just give another round of applause for Dr. Esther's uh, thumbs up? Uh, something just to indicate that you all are all there. 
Very good. Uh, first, uh, I just appreciate your um, your time, energy, and effort uh, in, in sharing these things. So uh, you kind of just done my work for me in many ways, because these are many conversations that I have across campus. But of course, you do so uh, much more eloquently than I could, uh, could do. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that kind of came through in the chat. I'll read them in order. I'll try to group them together as best I can. The first question was one around compensation for students that, um, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, it employ like the daily activities of, of MAP. So how do you compensate student leaders that manage the MAP program and then those that might work in smaller roles? So compensation, so all the students that you saw on that screen is, first of all, a great question. Appreciate the question. All the students um, are graduate students, right? they either my, in the, even currently in the past were graduate students. So they were already funded on an assistantship or a fellowship um, through our department or through our college or through the grad school. So, um, so to clarify, so every student has an assistantship. Let's just start there. At least, well, the same is true for Dr. Nablock and myself. If you are a graduate student of ours, being a part of MAP just comes as part of the territory. Uh, this is something we require. And, and I will say, that every student that has gotten a job, um, I, I can speak for mine especially, that to put that coordinator position on their resume or CV and those, bullet those bullets of what they had to carry out in that role was a difference maker when they interviewed. So there's a lot of value that came from them having this role as part of the MAP team. So hopefully that, that responds to the question. If it doesn't, feel free to put it in the chat and then I can, I can, uh, I can talk about it. Very cool. Thank you. It's also, it's also uh, them kind of engaging in the the mentoring program at one level, but that's it's also professional academic development that you kind yes. of yes, yes, without a doubt, school. without a doubt. Very cool. Uh, so we got another question around um, how do uh, students come to participate in the MAP program? So is there some sort of opt in, opt out after confirming admissions, or do they self nominate? Do faculty nominate? How do you get the students to kind of engage in, in the mentoring program? You mean, how do I get, how do we engage? Not our, not the team members, is that what you're referring to? I want to make sure I'm clear on. A very, yeah, so the, the actual mentees that are a part of the MAP program. So the participants, not the necessarily. Well, yeah, so, so, so the only, only time the mentees, the role of the mentee comes into play was through the peer mentor program. And in that case, uh, Tori would put out a call uh, and people would respond to the call. They would apply, if you will, and Tori and Ulyssa would manage that process. And of course, myself and Dr. Knobloch would, 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 would look over the recommendations and then say yay and nay, but I can't recall us ever turning down a student. Um, so it was, but one thing we did try to control was the number because one, Tori and Ulyssa were students and they, they only had an infinite amount of time, a certain amount of time they could dedicate so we kind of capped it at 12 students. So that, as far as the peer mentor program, that's how we manage that. Now, what I will say is that a lot of what students get from the MAP program is what they learn through those uh, monthly webinars or seminars that we put on. So they get a lot from those, those experiences as well. Very cool, thank you for that. And then we have a question from uh, Omar. Uh, Omar, you wanna, wanna go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, uh, uh, so Dr. Estes, thanks for doing this. Uh, Omar Faison, Social Vice President for Research, Economic Development, Grad Studies at Virginia State. Uh, and so I actually wanted to piggyback a little bit on your pitfalls slide. Um, in that one of the things that we see a lot is folks sort of reaching out uh, at the very last minute for an HBCU partner, um, which often feels like to be quite blunt about it, you just need some brown on your proposal. Um, and so that is a thing that, you know, I would recommend that folks uh, try to uh, avoid, you know, if you want to be a legitimate partner, we're more than happy to partner with you, but that is, you know, a, a, a thing that we run into um, way too often. So thanks for that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that to face on. Yeah. And thanks for, thanks for joining in today. Um, yeah, that happens all too often and, and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned it. And, and so I would, I would just encourage you, as Dr. Faison said, just mentioned, and you don't want to do that. Again, that, I think it's probably connected to this lack of respect. Um, and, and, and one thing for me, I, 
I can say that that never occurred with us because one, I'm a product of two institutions. So I understand, you know, you know the, the landscape, if you will. So we've been fortunate enough, but I see it happen across for university. People just, you know, knock on my door. They send me notes, hey, you got an HBC that we can collaborate with. So yeah, it does come across very disingenuous. And so I would encourage you all not to do that. So thank you for that comment. Agreed. And I'll just uh, emphasize that again, that, <laughs> that and the cold calling coupled together just does not not work well. Uh, it just doesn't. When folks say, hey, can you send this out to your contacts? Uh, it just doesn't it just doesn't work well. I haven't seen any success with that. So I'll, I'll echo. Uh, Sierra, I'm going to go ahead and unmute me. Uh, uh, my name is Sierra. I'm a fourth year graduate student here at Michigan. Um, thank you for giving your talk. I also follow you on Twitter. Um, my question okay. is for students that are interested in the type of career that you have, um, what did your trajectory look like and what advice do you have? I'm also a HBCU grad. I went to Winston-Salem State for undergrad. Um, and Tony Larkin, who's also on this call, we started a nonprofit for HBCU students to support them through the transition to graduate school. So just trying to figure out how to continue that post-graduate school and if that's a career path uh, that I want to go into, what does that look like? Yeah, uh, great question, Sierra. So, uh, Winston Salem State, yes, show love with HBCUs. Thanks. I saw Edmund give a clap. I would do the same. So, um, let me tackle the first part of your question. So, as far as my trajectory, I knew early on I wanted to be a faculty member. And so that's where my career took me. I earned my PhD at Penn State. Then I went to Iowa State. I was there for five years and then came to Purdue in 2009. And so early in my career, I was engaged with uh, undergraduate education, teacher education in particular, but that just wasn't my cup of tea. And so I had the opportunity to change my faculty appointment. And now I only focus on grad education. That's all I do is grad education. I teach only grad courses. Um, and then and the opportunity for me, uh, you know, I knew I wanted to engage with HBCUs and, and help the college in this recruitment and retention space. And so me and my colleague, Dr. Knobloch, kicked around this idea uh, to write a grant. And then we had actually had a, so he and I did not come up with the name Matt. We had a grad student, uh, Kristen Bodden, shout out to Kristen Bodden, who actually came up with the name Matt. And, and then myself and Dr. Knobloch, just, it just things just kind of spiraled. And now 10 years later, I think it's fair to say that a lot of my brand identity, and it wasn't intentional, is attached to Matt, attached to mentoring, attached to grad education, uh, work with HBCUs, as people know me to be. Um, but I think for you, to your other question, there's a lot of room to work in this space. Uh, you see a resurgence, I hate saying it that way, but you do see a, a national resurgence, if you will, because of Kamala Harris, uh, because of, um, I forget from Georgia, Stacey Abrams, um, and lots of other folks, right? Um, the NBA, I thought, actually did a good job this year with the All-Star Game, engaging Thurgood Marshall Fund and, and UNCF. So there's a space for this. And I know lots of folks that do research in this space, that are practitioners in this space. And so there's not, there's, there's an overabundance of opportunity. So I would encourage you just, the, the key is to have a really good idea, to be committed to it, and, and, and just to, you know, to reach out, people like myself and others, and, and think of ways that you can you know, carve out your niche or your lane, if you will, and just stick to it. Um, I think if you do that, I think good things will come. And 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 give you talk offline if you want after this. But I think for me, that's what I've learned, and I think that's the advice I would give you that there, there is more than enough opportunities. And I think if that's what you want to do, that's where your passion lies. You just stay with it. Thank you. Yeah, very good. I'm gonna uh, go back to the chat really quickly for a couple questions that came uh, through there. Uh, so one was around um, how do you manage the, the relationships uh, with so many institutions? And then how do you kind of keep them meaningful uh, across those institutions? And I think like a second part of that is um, one centered around authenticity. Like how do you engage uh, HBCUs and other MSIs in authentic ways and then manage that relationship over time with multiple institutions? Yeah, good. that's a good question. No one's ever asked me that question. Um, so a couple of things we do. So we engage with, in, with these institutions. Now, mind you, we just added a, probably a good, I don't know, six in the last month. But 
what we try to do is we try to engage uh, all institutions in some of our core activities. So we invite them to learn uh, our webinars and our seminars. We encourage them to send students to our MAP Summer Scholars Program. So giving the students opportunities uh, with the mentor program. We want to get with our grant projects like the mentor, we want to engage them. So we try to share as many opportunities. Now, again, at the end of the day, we don't want to force Alabama State or, or excuse me, Alabama AM or, or Delaware State to engage, but we do share opportunities. But at the very least, if they don't pursue those opportunities, the fact that they can participate through our webinars and learn how they can impact the culture and, and help students at their institutions is one way. And then also sending students to our summer scholars program. I think those are probably the two leading ways that we kind of engage with those institutions. But at the end of the day, it's their choice. Uh, but I do think that one of the reasons why, I'll give you a good example, Kentucky State, we just had a Kentucky State three weeks ago. And one of the reasons that what compelled them to want to participate was being able to provide their students with opportunities or access to grad education and to learn about what grad school is about. Because a lot of students are first generation, they may be the first and who have an interest in grad school, but they don't know much about grad school. So I think that was one of the compelling reasons for Kentucky State to want to come aboard and, and work with us. Yeah, thank you for that. I always like to say, uh, act in good faith. So especially from the, from the front end, so go into it without the expectation of something in return. So just engage off of just good faith uh, and continue to engage uh, over time. The reality is the institution may not want to work with you, but if you're acting from a space of good faith, then, then all is right with, within the world. Uh, and if they do decide to engage with you, kind of you know, continue on through sustain opportunities and resources as, as Levon pointed out. So thank you for that. Uh, we have time for one more question. So uh, Dan, you're going to be our closer uh, here today. Yeah, thanks, Levon, for that great talk. I, I'm just curious, you know, there is an imbalance between um, particularly physical uh, research resources at an R1 institution and HBCUs. And so many of our programs are designed to um, bring students here, for instance, for an opportunity. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are and how that can be done better so that you avoid the little brother syndrome. Like by, by you know, it's almost like approaching saying you have to come here to get a, a more meaningful experience than you could get at your own HBCU. Yeah, and that's a good question. Uh, so thank you for that. Well, I think to one thing, I think, I think there's a lot of value in, because I've heard students share about why I went to Illinois. So I taught high school in Chicago at the Chicago High School of Ag Sciences. And we had a lot of students that went to Illinois, Michigan State, Minnesota, Iowa State for these summer research opportunities. And they would come back and say, wow, Mr. Esters, I learned so much. So I do think there's some value in that. Having said that, I think the other thing that could occur is by people like yourself and others going to those institutions and maybe you create have something innovative like a, re, a, a you know faculty in residence where you spend a semester or some type of resource exchange where you're giving back and helping faculty and, and working on projects, building their capacity. So I think if you do those sorts of things, then yeah, there's still going to be an imbalance. But I do think that you're moving the needle a little bit because you know you are investing your time and energy, and also there could be some good that comes out of it by a new uh, idea for a grant proposal, a new course any type, you know, those sorts of things I think come out of those relationships. Thank you for that. And I just want to point out, highlight um, Omar's uh, um, response in, in the comments to consider collaborations with faculty at the HBC on at the HBCU campus. And again, there's, there's evidence of those types of things that's taking place. Rob Mickey is on the call from political science and with Jackson State University of Puerto Rico. They're using their uh, MSI grant dollars to um, provide research type and the students at those institutions, right? So again, I think they're are ways to engage and what you kind of get at, I think is the question around um, being intellectually responsive. We talk about like the cultural part, but there's also this, this thing between like the elitist Michigans and Northwesterns and Purdue's of the world and how we, uh, you know, walk into these spaces with, with HBCUs. And again, these are folks who hold PhDs, PhDs in the same spaces that you hold them in, right? So they they are, um, you know, being intellectually and engaging in intellectually responsive ways are also critically important to know that 
in the research can take place in different spaces, uh, given, uh, um, you know, notwithstanding that Michigan may have uh, some sort of equipment that perhaps the HBCU doesn't, but research can still take place at the, the HBCU. We are just at time. Uh, so again, another round of applause for uh, Dr. S is here for his time, energy, and effort this afternoon. Uh, I am greatly appreciative of him. Uh, I will echo uh, his sentiments to reach out. Uh, every time I reach out, he responds, uh, which uh, not everybody does. So um, I'm, I'm always appreciative of him, um, you know, kind of uh, reaching out. Um, again, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, thank, again, Dr. Esther, I appreciate your, your efforts. Uh, we have another coffee chat um, coming up next week if you all are uh, interested in attending. Um, next week, Wednesday, April 7th, uh, same time with Dr. Jasmine Collins uh, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and she'll talk about inclusive and re responsive um, teaching practices, particularly around social uh, political events in the classroom and how to uh, support students from MSIs in, in that way. So I encourage for you all to join us for, for that as well. So again, thank you, Dr. Esters. Thank you all for your, um, your attention here this afternoon. Thank you. You all be well. Thanks again, Evan. Thank you. Hey, Edmund. Hey, Dan. I don't know if you saw, but the, they just released the uh, Biden infrastructure plan. I haven't seen it yet, no. Yeah, there's about, I would, I didn't add it all up, but there's about 40 to $50 billion specifically okay. for MSIs. Okay. Uh, kind of creating center. I think I sent you one of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Past, but it's actually in now also in the Biden infrastructure plan. Okay. I'm gonna follow up on that today. I obviously have to see what, how it all plays out. But it yeah. looks pretty cool. They're gonna, you know, try to create these centers of excellence and stuff mm -hmm. and, and have a certain percentage of them be mm -hmm. targeted towards HBCUs. I think it'll be which is important. Yeah. New opportunities, That's new opportunities for growing this program. Yeah, that's that's my next goal. My next goal is to think about how we shift away from institutional funding and get larger uh, so, or get support from like other like foundations and, and uh, yeah. other agencies. Right. Because that's the, the next step. I think I think you all are all doing important work and your respective spaces. Rod Mickey, yeah. you know, here, I think what he's doing with Jackson State and University of Puerto Rico is great. And there's other examples out there is uh, as well. But again, from a sustainability perspective, we got to figure out like how do we take these smaller buckets of eight thousand or thirty thousand dollars and think about like, well, how can we get a hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant per program for a five year period of time, right, or three year, yeah. time, whatever it may be. Um, so somebody is just joining; they must be on Central Time. So uh, let's. See. No, that's just me turning on my camera. Sorry, I'm having a bad hair day. No, that's no, uh, okay. We have somebody from uh, just joining in. Oh, so just real quickly on that, Edmund, before I forget, I'm glad mm -hmm. you brought that up. I've got a, a foundation that the LSNA Development Office told me about mm -hmm. who is interested in these sorts of things. So okay. um, let's talk about that soon. Yes, yes, yes. You know how I work. Just send me an invite. I'll be there. Will do. Thanks for this. This was awesome. He, Very good. What he's doing is just incredible. Incredible. I'm, I'm trying. I don't know if I could do it without without you all and the work you're doing. So <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Be good. You too. Take care. Hi, Natasha. How are you? happen so I think it's hi Natasha how are you hi how are you I'm doing well can you hear me okay were you were you joining us for the coffee chat today yes I am okay so are you are you on central time yes Okay, so the mistake is on, on my part. It was at it was 3 p.m. Eastern time. I, I apologize. Oh no. <laughs> I apologize. But we did record it. So I'm happy to I'm happy to uh, share the recording with you if you're interested in that. Or if you just want to chat further at some point. We'll send me the link. 
the recording. I, I'd love to hear it. Um, I had met Levon not too long ago yeah. through my cousin. Okay. So I was really interested to hear it, but that's so funny. Yeah. I, and you know, I, I asked her too. I said, is this Eastern or Central? Because they're all in Indiana. So yeah. and I'm in <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> Yeah, where where are you? Where are you uh, coming calling from? I'm calling from Chicago. From Chicago, okay, very cool. Chicago, I call Chicago my home, uh, but uh, or my second home rather. But Chicago is perhaps one of my most favorite places in the world. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I was so interested to hear like other feedback. Because, like for instance, I'm calling actually from my company. Mm -hmm. I am the coordinator for our business resource group called ABLE, okay. Alliance of Black Employees. Yeah. So I was calling, you know, to hear some information, get some feedback, see, see what people are talking about, because we are looking to partner mm -hmm. with universities, you know, to make that connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get more uh, inclusive talent, so. No, I think that's great. Uh, uh, talking to Levon, what, what, 100% be a, um, a great thing. There may even be opportunities to, depending on like what kind of talent you're looking for. And when I say that, I mean by like um, like major skill set, like that type of thing, right? Uh, right? There may be opportunities to connect with some of the programs that are doing, here, doing things here and think about like the graduate students who are coming from HBCUs into graduate programs here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and for folks who- Yeah, because yeah, we are a manufacturing plant. Oh, cool. Okay. So a corn manufacturing plant. So we're looking for engineers, technicians, operators, and um, some also with science backgrounds for our labs. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I should uh, get your contact information if you don't mind. No, uh, no, not a problem. Yeah. Are you able to drop it in the chat or uh, would you yeah, prefer sure email? I'll give you my email. Would that work better? I can do both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. When you clicked in, I said up. Oh, she probably thought that it was, uh, and that's that's my mistake because um, I know that in some spaces, I, I note that it is in uh, Eastern Standard or Eastern Daylight, uh, but mm -hmm. I clearly missed somewhere, so. <laughs> Not a problem. I got your email now, so definitely look out for an email from me and I can send you more information of what we're looking at. Very cool. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for um, chiming in to let me know that what's going on. So. No, I wouldn't let you hang around uh, in, in by yourself. So Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.